Let's turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, there were three major feasts that were required that all of the males attend each year. The Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And according to the law of Moses, if you have moved away a distance and you could not attend, it was a compulsory attendance, but if you moved so far that you could not attend, then you had to attend as often as you could. In other words, you didn't have to attend every feast each year, but you should come back and attend as often as possible. The feasts were, for the most part, memorial type of feast. But also, they were anticipatory. The Feast of Passover was a memorial. The night that the angel of the Lord went through Egypt and the firstborn in all the land was slain, except those who had followed the provision that God had made, and that is the sacrifice of a lamb for the firstborn, the blood of the lamb being put upon the lintels and the doorpost of the house, in order that it might be marked as a house that has been covered by the sacrifice of the lamb, in those houses the firstborn was not slain. It was spared, but throughout all of Egypt, the firstborn in every household, even to the pharaohs, was slain that night by the Lord when he passed through the land. So the Feast of Passover was a memorial, a reminder of God's wonderful provision whereby the blood on the lintels and the doorposts of the house provided life for the firstborn. They were not slain when this plague hit. It was anticipatory in that it was looking forward to the Lamb of God that would be slain for the world. So it was not by accident, but by design, that Jesus was crucified on the day of Passover. You know that the Jewish day begins at sundown, and it goes from sundown to sundown. In Genesis, in the creation account, it says, and it was evening and it was morning, day one. It was evening, it was morning, day two. So they start their day in the evening at sundown, and it goes to the following sundown. Jesus had had the Passover supper with his disciples after the sundown, on, which began the day of Passover at sundown, six o'clock. He then had the Passover supper with the disciples that night. The next day was still Passover up until six o'clock that day. And thus, Jesus, the night that he was betrayed, had the Passover supper with his disciples. He was tried. He was brought to Pilate. By nine o'clock in the morning, he was hanging on the cross. He was taken down, it says, because the Jews did not want anyone hanging there on the Sabbath day. Uh, and uh, thus, uh, they uh, were anxious to get the bodies off of the cross before sundown. John tells us that that Sabbath day was the great Sabbath. 
Now the first day after the feast of uh, the Passover, the first day afterwards was the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was a seven-day feast. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, both the first and the last days, were Sabbath days. So you have an interesting situation where you had the Sabbath day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, first day after Passover. You had then the regular Sabbath day, which was from Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown. And then you had them coming to the empty tomb early on Sunday morning. So the second feast was the Feast of Pentecost. Now, this was a feast more or less of Thanksgiving. The winter grains are harvested in the first part of June. And the idea of Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, was a thanksgiving feast unto the Lord for the harvest. And they would go out to their fields and they would cut a corner of the field. And they would take and bind the sheaves and they would bring them in as a sacrifice to the Lord, as a wave offering unto the Lord, offering to the Lord the first fruits. The idea being that there is a large field yet to be harvested, we give to God the first fruits. We honor God with the first fruits of the harvest, but recognizing that God has given us this great harvest, we give to him the first fruits. So it was significant that the church was born on the day of Pentecost, the second feast day, had its fulfillment in the birth of the church when the Holy Spirit was poured upon the disciples, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. And uh, that was the first fruits of the great harvest of souls that would take place through the church. 3,000 on that day were added to the church. The first fruits of the great harvest that was to be garnered in time. The third major feast was the Feast of Tabernacles. It was the feast that brought into memory God's preservation of their fathers through the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and how God kept them and preserved them for those 40 years that they were wandering in the wilderness. Of course, that feast ends with the rejoicing that God kept his promise, brought them into the promised land. It is a feast that has yet to have its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. It is a feast that will find its fulfillment when the Lord returns to the earth with his church to establish his kingdom upon the earth he has preserved us through these wilderness years. We look forward to that day when uh, we will come with Jesus to establish the kingdom of God upon the earth. And uh, thus, that feast will have its fulfillment in the second coming of Jesus Christ. So that is yet future. But the first two major feasts have already found their fulfillment. In Paul's writing to the Colossians chapter 2 concerning their feast, their holy days, their Sabbath days, and so forth, he said, these are all a shadow of things to come. The substance is of Christ. In other words, these things were all foreshadowing. The fulfillment is found in Jesus Christ. So, the day of Pentecost has fully come. And they are all together, it tells us. They were all with one accord in one place. Feast of Pentecost was 50 days after the Feast of Passover, or seven weeks after the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
Seven, it's called thus also the Feast of Weeks in the Old Testament. Uh, and it took place the seven weeks after the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 50 days after the Feast of uh, the Passover. And as you look at these feasts and you see their fulfillment in Jesus Christ, you see here a brilliant plan of God to have these feasts ingrained in the very fiber of the national life of the Jews. And they were set up by God in advance in the law where they were required to be in Jerusalem to observe these feasts. And when you realize that in those days they did not really have any effective method of communicating on a worldwide basis. News would travel very slowly because they didn't have what we have today, radios, telephones, and so forth. But what a brilliant move of God to ordain that the Jews who were scattered throughout the world would have to come back for at least one of the major feasts during the year. What better way to spread the news than to have them all there in Jerusalem during these major events? So that when Jesus was crucified on Passover, there were hundreds of thousands of Jews that had gathered from all over the world. And when they went home from this feast, they were all spreading the story about this man who claimed to be the Messiah and how he was crucified there in Jerusalem on Passover day. And the news was spread by the Jews that were there all over. It, it was an event that all of them knew about. You remember when Jesus joined the two disciples who were walking on the road to Emmaus the day of his resurrection. And he said, what are you guys talking about that makes you seem so sad? And they said, you must be the only one in Jerusalem that doesn't know the things that have happened the last few days. In other words, everybody knew it. You must be the only one that doesn't know. And he said, what things? And of course, they went on to tell him about the crucifixion of Jesus. And then he went on to show them how that it was a necessity, it was prophesied in the scriptures all the way from Moses through the prophets. So those that were at the Passover, you remember when Paul was uh, presenting his case before King Agrippa. And finally Festus cried out and he said, Paul, your much learning has made you mad. You've studied too hard. You flip, man. And Paul turned to Agrippa and he said, the king knows these things that I'm speaking about. For I'm persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. He'd been telling the king about the crucifixion of Jesus. He said, for this thing was not done in a corner. It wasn't some thing that was done in a back alley someplace. It was out there where everybody could see. And that was the purpose of the Roman government, to strike fear in the hearts of the people through the crucifixions. So... The Jews went home from the Passover feast and they told about this man, the talk of Jerusalem at that particular feast, crucified on Passover day. And probably many of them saw the crucifixion, 
heard the prayer of Jesus, Father, forgive them, commend his spirit unto the Father, declare it is finished. And they went home and told the story of this man, of the stories of him, how that people were healed by him, blind people were seeing, and lame people were walking, and he was, you know, he was an interesting person, but he was crucified by the Roman government. Now, 50 days later, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, and the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the church. There again are devout Jews gathered in Jerusalem from all over the world. And as they are there in Jerusalem, they hear this noise like a mighty rushing wind. They follow it to see where it's coming from and they come to the upper room where the disciples are being filled with the Spirit. They hear the message of Peter that this Jesus that was crucified was risen from the dead. And now the news spreads back through all the provinces throughout the world as they go home from uh, the Feast of Pentecost and they tell everybody that Jesus that was crucified is risen. So the message spreads without radio, television, or whatever, it, it spreads because God brought them here in Jerusalem for these major events, and then they go back dispersed throughout all the world, bearing the news that they learned while they were in Jerusalem. And when you look at the plan, it was absolutely brilliant because there is no other way that the gospel could have spread so rapidly throughout all the world than the method by which God ordained, bringing them to Jerusalem for the feast and having the major events take place on the feast days. Now we read that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord and in one place. I can remember growing up in a Pentecostal church that often there would be an emphasis in the tarrying meetings on getting our minds in one accord. And the hope was that we could, if we could all get in one accord, uh, we could create an atmosphere for a, another Pentecost, so to speak, another outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so as a child, I did my best to get my mind in one accord with the rest, but I didn't know what they were thinking. And, uh, uh, but I was, I was trying to just think on the Lord and, and the, you know, the Holy Spirit and all, and was a, endeavoring to sort of get in some kind of a mystical uh, one accord. But somehow I guess we were never able to get to that point because we never saw the repetition of Acts 2. But as I've grown in my understanding of the Word of God, I realize that there is no need for tarrying meetings. They were only to tarry until the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church. God had the perfect timing. And so some seven days before the day of Pentecost, Jesus told them to tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And seven days later, the day of Pentecost had fully come. God's timing is perfect, and he pours out the Holy Spirit upon the church. After that, it was never necessary to tarry for the empowering of the Holy Spirit. There was the laying on of hands by the apostles for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Sometimes there wasn't even a laying on of hands with Peter in the house of Cornelius just while he was speaking. The Holy Spirit fell upon them as it did at the beginning, the day of Pentecost. With Paul in the church of Ephesus, he laid his hands on him. But with Paul himself, Ananias, who was just a disciple, just a believer, a brother in the church in Damascus, 
was sent to lay his hands on Paul to be healed, to receive his sight and to receive the Holy Spirit. So it wasn't just by the apostles, but it was imparted uh, by the believers to each other, those who were gifted, uh, the laying on of hands and the receiving of the Holy Spirit. But never again do you read of them tarrying for the Holy Spirit, but just by faith now receiving this gift of God because the gift was given on the day of Pentecost and thus there was no need for waiting beyond that point. It was just after that receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, we read that there was certain supernatural phenomena that accompanied the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the believers. First of all, there was a sound from heaven like as of a mighty rushing wind. Sounds something like maybe the Santanas when they're blowing and they're whistling through the cracks in your window frames. Or like a sound of a tornado or the sound of a hurricane, the sound like of a mighty rushing wind. The second phenomena was there were these little flames of fire above each of them. And then, of course, the third phenomena was they began to speak in glossa or in unknown tongues. Paul in Corinthians calls it unknown tongues. Here it says they began to speak in other tongues. But the tongues were unknown to those that were speaking them, or the languages were unknown to those that were speaking them, thus the idea of an unknown tongue. It's uh, to the person speaking just uh, sounds, but uh, to those that are uh, knowledgeable of other languages, oftentimes it is a language that they know. The thought or idea is that you are divinely speaking in another language that you do not know or you did not acquire through study. To the person speaking an unknown tongue, to the varied language groups, it said, how is it that we hear them speaking in our own dialectus? And so the one word is glossa, which is an unknown tongue, uh, and yet the unknown tongues to the person speaking were to others dialects. They were speaking in the various dialects as they were praising God and giving glory to God. They began to speak in these other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Weymouth translates that as the Spirit gave them the ability the Douay version, the Catholic version, translates that as the Spirit prompted their speech. And the NIV translates it as the Spirit enabled them. All of them are good and helpful to understand how the gift of the Holy Spirit operates. The Spirit of God prompting their speech the Spirit of God enabling them to speak in these different languages, the Spirit of God giving them the ability to speak in these different languages, or as the Spirit in our King James gives them utterance. Notice these things. They all began to speak, and the Spirit gave them utterance or prompted their speech. Here we see that perfect working together of the supernatural with the natural. One of the things about the way God works in our lives is that it is in such a natural way that many times we fail to recognize the supernatural aspects of it. 
we seem to think that there's going to be some kind of a buzz, some kind of flashing lights, some kind of tingling sensations, or, or some kind of uh, manifestation that uh, will think, ooh, yes, you know, this is God. But it, the way the Spirit works so often is so natural that you don't even recognize it as being supernatural until it comes to pass. And, and you see it, and then you think, wow, you know, that was the Spirit that prompted that thought to my mind. The Spirit was speaking to me, and, and when it was happening, you didn't recognize it as such. Jeremiah, and throughout his whole book, you read over and over again, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, saying, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet saying, over and over you read that phrase. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet saying, go down to the potter's house and I'll speak to you there. And so Jeremiah went down to the potter's house and watched him as he worked to work on the wheels and the work was marred in the hands of the potter and the potter, you know, sort of crushed the thing down and he made another vessel that pleased the potter and the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, thus is Israel in my hands, are not I able to take the marred vessel and make of it a vessel that pleases me and so forth. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And we read the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and said, buy the field of your uncle Hammonbeal because uh, the right of redemption is yours. Jeremiah was in the dungeon when this thought came. The next morning his cousin came in and said, my dad sent me to you to tell you that his field is coming up for redemption. He can't redeem it, but he'd like you to redeem it. Jeremiah said, then I knew it was the word of the Lord that said to me, buy the field. Now, the way Jeremiah tells it, because he's telling it after the fact. He said, well, the Lord spoke to me, or the word of the Lord came to me, but he's telling it after the fact. And, and when it comes to pass, you realize, whoa, that was the Lord speaking to me, you know, because you can now look back and, and see the confirmation uh, of the thought or the idea, but you're not always aware of it at the time. And so often uh, we, we find that as, as we are speaking and as we perhaps are drawing an illustration, seeking to illustrate a truth or a point, we'll start developing this, this story or illustration and then later on we find that, man, we were really nailing someone with it. We were describing exactly what they were involved in and what they were doing. And, and uh, they, they, you know, think that uh, we're, we're pointing at them or we're... Uh, we were talking one night here about false prophets. And of course we were on the radio. And uh, we described how they live down on Lido Island and they drive a white Cadillac convertible. And, uh, you know, and went on describing just, you know, and they have this mailing list and they just uh, are living off the mailing list. They send these letters out, you know, talking about their ministries and so forth and soliciting support. And, and they live a, a luxurious life down there on Lido and, and uh, really don't have much of a ministry, but uh, they're collecting money from all over the United States living off their mailing list. The next morning, my secretary said, Chuck, there's a guy on the phone. He's insisting on talking to you, and he's really mad. <laughs> and uh, so I said, well, put him through. And the guy started to read me the riot act for uh, talking about him on the radio. <laughs> and I said, beg your pardon, sir. Who are you? I, I, I don't think I know you. He said, oh, yes, you do. He said, I'm the one with the white Cadillac convertible. I live on Lido Island. He said, but I want you to know that I have a legitimate ministry. <laughs> I said, well, if I were you, I would take a second look because I said, I don't, I've never heard of you. I, I, I was just drawing an illustration out of the air. 
I had no idea that that guy was living down there. Why did I say Lido Island instead of Balboa Island? Why didn't I say a black Cadillac instead of a white Cadillac? Why did I say Camaro? I don't, it was just, but then all of a sudden you realize, wow, the Lord was trying to nail the guy. I'll probably get a call from him again tomorrow. <laughs> But it's an amazing way that the Spirit of God works. And it's all oftentimes so natural that we fail to recognize the supernatural aspects of it until later on and we can look back and we can see God's hand was in that. And you can see how God was guiding or God was directing. I was coming home from Los Angeles and I was in the right hand lane on the freeway and I suddenly just pulled over to the uh, left hand lane, the faster lane and uh, pulled across all three lanes and was over in this fast lane and I was just thinking to myself, what in the world am I doing? Why did I do that? And just as that thought was going through, here came two cars on this merging freeway doing about 100 miles an hour, racing each other. And had I been in that right lane, I'd have had it. And all of a sudden I realized, you know, just that I was even wondering about myself. That was stupid. Why would you do that? You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I really looked in my rearview mirror hoping there were no cops behind me because... <laughs> I could have gotten a ticket for that. And uh, then I said, oh, Lord, you know, you're so good. Um, it, it's just, but supernaturally being directed, though it happens in natural ways so often that we don't even recognize. I'm sure when we get to heaven, we're going to find out that our guardian angel was working overtime uh, many times. and. And we were protected from things that we didn't even think about. Maybe a flat tire that slows us down. We, we you know, all mumbling and grumbling and complaining, this flat tire, you know, I'm supposed to be there and all. And how do you know but what God isn't keeping you from an accident down the road? That, that God is in all of these things because God is concerned about you and every little aspect of your life. And I'm sure when we get to heaven, we're going to discover that he was working a lot more than what we even realized. Behind the scenes, watching over, keeping, guarding, protecting. And so here's a great example of how the natural works with the supernatural. They began to speak as the Spirit gave them the ability or as the Spirit prompted their speech. Now, again, growing up in the Pentecostal church, I would hear people give testimonies about speaking in tongues and about receiving the gift and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I would hear the phrases being used of how the Spirit really was speaking through that person, or my, the Spirit is really speaking through him tonight. And uh, so I had the idea that somehow the Holy Spirit would take over the motor functions of my body and that he would just speak through me. And I was desiring as a young fellow to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I would oftentimes just open up my mouth and wait for the Spirit to speak through me. Because that was the, the impression that I had from hearing the various testimonies. But they began to speak. It's your voice. 
It isn't suddenly some voice coming through you. It is your voice. What is the glorious aspect of it is that the Spirit is the one that is prompting the speech. He is the one that is prompting the sounds that are being uttered. Now to you, they are just sounds. You don't have understanding. Paul said, when I pray in tongues, I'm praying in the Spirit, though my understanding is unfruitful. Don't understand it. So what shall I say? Well, I'll pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with understanding also. In other words, both. Praying in, 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 in words in English that I understand, but also praying in tongues that I don't understand. Language is a fascinating thing. It's nothing more than an agreement between people that certain sounds are conveying certain ideas. As long as we are in agreement that these funny sounds are communicating these ideas, we can intelligibly communicate with one another in the language that we speak. It is possible to make up a language. Now, when we were kids, we often would speak in Pig Latin to our friends. And you all know what that's about. And you all caught on to it, ultimately, and could understand. But it was fun to talk in Pig Latin when a person couldn't understand you. And you could communicate to your friends in sort of a coded way and everybody else sort of stands in, 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 in a quizzical way and they don't understand what you're saying. Or sometimes we would make up code words. Uh, we even, in communicating and liking to communicate with others not understanding, we developed a thing where we would put sort of a... Uh, vowel sounds on, on the end of the letters, and we would spell. Uh, but we would, by putting this crazy sound onto the letter, people wouldn't catch on. Uh, my friend Tony, he was tut o nat yak uh, <laughs> spelled, you know, the tut o nat yak and, and so I'd spell out Tony, but people, tut o nat yak you know, and, uh, but it was, it was fun to sort of make up the languages. And as long as we agree together that this is what this sound is communicating, we can create a language, but we have to have the agreement. So, ug can mean, let's go over to the Logos coffee shop after the service tonight. Nug means good idea. <laughs> Yug means who's buying. <laughs> so after church, you could come up and say Ug, and I'd say Nug and Yug, you know. <laughs> and we'd take off for Logos, and people would say, what in the world's happening there, you know? Well, we have made an agreement that this is what this sound means. And as long as we are and agreeing with those sounds, we can communicate to each other in peculiar, funny sounds. Now, face it, dog. That's a funny sound. But I, you all know what I'm talking about because we have an agreement that this funny sound dog means a pet animal that many of us have at home. Cat, another crazy sound, but because we have an agreement that that also refers to a family pet, 
uh, we can communicate and we can talk about dogs and cats and we know what we're talking about. If I would go into a restaurant in Spain, have a waiter that doesn't know English, and I'm trying to tell him that I want some bread with my dinner. And I say, bread, bread. And he just sort of. <laughs> and so I have a Jewish friend with me, and he says, lekum, lekum. <laughs> the guy still goes. And my German friend says, brut, brut. <laughs> I still. Peculiar sounds. Have you ever stood on a street corner of a foreign country where they didn't speak English? I like to do that when I'm in foreign countries, just sort of stand on the street corner and listen to people talk to each other. And to me, it is always a mystery that they can be communicating <laughs> ideas with those crazy sounds. How is it they seem to be understanding each other? They're nodding and, and they're, they're animated in their talking and I'm sure they're understanding each other and they're saying something. But I'm totally at a loss. And, and it, to me it's a mystery that those peculiar sounds could really be expressing thoughts or ideas. Language is a very interesting thing. It is an agreement, a covenant, that certain sounds are expressing certain ideas and thus we are able to communicate with each other. Now the speaking in an unknown tongue is a covenant that we make with God. And by faith, I am going to speak unto God in sounds that I do not understand, but I, by faith, am trusting the Holy Spirit to form those sounds or to prompt those sounds so that God will understand them as praise, adoration, worship from my heart to the Lord. Now, it is an absolute insult to my intellect. It is a put down to my intellect. It seems childish to utter sounds that I do not understand. It takes faith to do it. They began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit prompted their speech, as the Spirit gave them the ability, or as the Spirit enabled them, or as the Spirit gave them utterance. So there is that interesting cooperation, the supernatural with the natural. I begin to speak by faith, trusting the Holy Spirit, to form the words in a language I don't understand, but trusting and believing that God understands it, that it is expressing my spirit's gratitude and love and appreciation to God. My thanksgiving unto God. And so Paul says, I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with understanding. Now, the interesting thing, here on the day of Pentecost, as they, the, these Galileans, the, the disciples, were uttering these sounds that were totally foreign to them, those that were standing around from the different nations that had come for the Feast of Pentecost, they weren't foreign sounds to them. In fact, they were amazed, they were surprised that these people were speaking in 17 different languages at least. There's listed here 17. The Medes, Parthians, and so forth. Uh, and they were surprised that these people were speaking in their own dialects, 
the wonderful works of God. Glorifying God, declaring the wonderful works of God in their various languages, and that shocked them, that surprised them. They didn't know what to make of that. Others began to mock, saying, well, <laughs> they're drunk. They've got hold of some wine someplace. And so Peter stood up, and notice he didn't speak in tongues. He spoke in a language that they all understood. And he said, men and brethren, hearken unto me. These men are not drunken, as you suppose. And he began to explain what was going on. The interesting thing I have found is that so many times when a person has received this gift of the Holy Spirit and the gift of tongues, though they are uttering sounds that are foreign to them and foreign to those usually that are there, oftentimes there is someone there that does understand the language. We were praying for a young man to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And as we were praying, he began to say, Daja, Daja, Daja. And I thought, Daja, you know, I mean, just come on, you know. <laughs> but this lady made her way around the circle and she said, Brother Smith, Brother Smith, that's my language. That's Czechoslovakia. And he's saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. And soon he began to speak in the Czech language as she interpreted for us. Another lady in the church who, when she speaks in tongues, speaks in French. And it's fascinating to uh, hear because you can recognize that it's French. In fact, we were having a meeting in the early days of Calvary Chapel. We uh, were in transition and we were actually meeting in the East uh, Bluff Clubhouse on a Sunday night, Pentecost Sunday night, in fact. And so after the study, uh, we said, well, let's just have a time of prayer. This is Pentecost Sunday, and let's just wait on the Holy Spirit. And this lady began to speak in tongues, in French, and uh, I began to pick up I, a little bit of what she was saying because I, I've studied Latin and so uh, I could tell that she was saying something about a, a, a song and love and joy. And then my wife interpreted her tongues and again it was thanking the Lord really that God had given to her a new song, a song of joy, a song of love uh, and she had been formerly a nightclub singer, and, and thus I thought, oh, that's how significant, you know, to be thanking the Lord for the new song of love and all for him. That night, a young fellow had brought his girlfriend from Palm Springs to talk to me after the service. She was a Jewish girl having some real problems, and so as we sat down to talk to her after everyone had gone, she said, before we get into my problems, what in the world was going on here tonight with the one woman speaking in French to all of the group and the other lady uh, interpreting or translating for the group uh, what she was saying? And I said, well, would you believe that neither of them know French? And she looked rather incredulously and said, you're kidding me. And I said, no. I said, the one's my wife and I know she doesn't know French. <laughs> And so I took her to the scriptures and I showed her the, the gift of tongues with interpretation. How that it was something there in the Bible, it was something that was scriptural. I said, this was just the practice of these gifts. She said, I lived in Paris for five years. She said, and I speak French fluently. She said, not only was that woman speaking in French, she had an aristocratic accent. I said, well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> God's pretty aristocratic. 
My daughter, who was a French major in UCI, well, actually, she had five years of French, so I guess that's quite a bit, but does speak French very well. We were getting ready to go over to Arizona where I was directing a youth camp. She was to be the girl's counselor. And so we were all praying together on a Sunday night. We were going to leave uh, the next day for Arizona so I could conduct the camps. And so the family was there, and this lady came up to my daughter who was there praying, and she laid hands on her and began to pray in French. And my daughter said, Daddy, goosebumps rose up all over me because I could understand what she was praying. She was praying, Lord, help Jan to be a real powerful witness to these girls. Let the love of Jesus just come forth through her and let the hearts of these little girls just be touched and won for Jesus Christ through her witness and through her life. And she said, to think that the Holy Spirit was praying this for me, Daddy, it just gave me goosebumps all over. Now, to the lady who was praying, it was just sounds, unknown tongue. But yet, in reality, it was a dialect. It was a language. And, and thus, it's, it's, a, it's a step of faith. And you know, when you talk about gifts, you're talking about faith. Salvation is a gift of God. How do you receive it? By faith. And thus, with the other gifts of the Spirit, they are received and they are exercised by faith. Oh, I have so much to say on this. And uh, Growing up in a penny... Oh, this, where are we? Uh, growing up in a Pentecostal background, uh, I've seen everything. And uh, over 50% of it I don't agree with. But uh, I've seen everything. And I've seen the traditional Pentecostal practices where we are anxious to see someone receive the gift, say, of tongues, and I, I've seen where people are encouraged to repeat a word over and over again, such as glory, 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 and, or Jesus, 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 Jesus. And, and it was sort of a traditional Pentecostal method of helping a person to receive the gift of tongues. And I looked at that very disdainfully. vain repetition. And in time, the Lord has mellowed me a lot. And I began to realize that though it was sort of a gimmick, yet uh, faith is the key. Faith is the key. And what happens so often when a person is saying glory, 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 real fast, soon it gets sort of slurred and something comes out that isn't glory. And at that moment, the person thinks, ooh, I have it by faith. And they begin to speak in tongues because their tongue got twisted. We had a lady, in fact, if I told you her name, you would know her husband. He was a uh, very famous high school coach here in Orange County for several years. And uh, we were conducting a Bible study in Newport Beach, and she was attending. And so this one night, she asked that uh, we would pray for her, that she might be uh, filled with the Spirit. We did. She went home. Her husband was uh, watching Monday Night Football. And so she went into the bedroom and knelt down and started praying. And she heard this sound like a mighty rushing wind. 
And she got all excited and thought, oh, the Lord's filling me. And she began to speak in tongues, only to later discover the furnace had gone on. Faith, though, you see, is the thing. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And faith plays a big part in this. As I say, it takes faith to utter sounds you don't understand. It's an, in, it's, it's an insult to your intellect. But um, we'll, we'll get into this more as we get into X. Why lay on hands? Why is it that they took sweat brands from Paul and laid them on the sick people who were healed? How is it that the shadow of Peter falling on people, they were healed? It all comes back to the thing of faith. We'll, we'll have to tackle this again. It's, it's an important issue important area and an important issue. Father, we thank you for the power and the gift of your Holy Spirit that you gave to the church as an abiding possession on the day of Pentecost. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit within our lives as he conforms us into the image of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the help of the Holy Spirit in our prayer life as he makes intercession according to your will. We thank you, Lord, for the power of the Holy Spirit in praying for the sick. The power of the Holy Spirit in dealing with difficult issues. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the word of prophecy. Lord, we do desire when we come to you that every page is open, that we don't have any restrictions that we're putting on you. Lord, we want everything that you have for us because if you have it for us, we need it. And so, Lord, help us not to close any doors but to be open unto you and to the Spirit and to whatever, Lord, you might be wishing to give to us of the power, the anointing, and the strength of the Spirit in our lives. Help us, Lord, to be effective witnesses for you. Fill us, Lord. We want more of you and less of self. Lord, we want all of you and none of self. Bring us to that place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? Immediately following over in the fellowship hall, there will be a time of waiting on the Holy Spirit receiving the gifts of the Holy Spirit, instruction in that area. And so if you're interested, we encourage you to go over there and receive what God has for you of the work and the blessings of the Spirit-filled life. Down here in the front, the pastors are here to pray for your needs, uh, financial, physical, whatever, marital problems. They're here to pray for you and to minister to you in prayer. So as soon as we're dismissed, if you'd like, come forward. Or if others would like to receive and exercise the spiritual gifts, we encourage you to go over to the Fellowship Hall. May the Lord be with you. May the Lord bless you. And may you be filled to overflowing with the fullness of His Spirit. In Jesus' name. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me,
Sim.